Welcome to another episode of Lessons in Humanities. The title of today's lesson is The Age of Jackson. The content covered in this uh, video lesson is going to include the years when Andrew Jackson was president, and it will include things like the bank wars, the nullification crisis, Eaton affairs, and also the Panic of 1837, which happened after Jackson was out of office. So if you think that's interesting, please stick around. All right, before I begin, if uh, you're interested in this PPT, please check the link below. I also have lots of great lesson plans if you're interested. And of course, please hit the thumbs up button and please subscribe. That will help me um, with the algorithm and get more people watching my videos. So I would really appreciate that. So with that, we can begin. So we're going to talk about the AIDS of Jackson. And as you know, Andrew Jackson was a very controversial character in the early to mid 1800s and he's so memorable that they have a, a, a time or an age or an era named after him. So if you look on this timeline right there from the late 1820s to the mid 1830s is called the age of Jackson and lots of events would happen which is why he will get that name. Now, the presence that will be discussed in this presentation will include, of course, Andrew Jackson, but we'll also go into Van Buren, because Van Buren was also a Democrat, and he had a lot of the same ideas or ideologies as Andrew Jackson. And then we're going to go into two Whigs with uh, Henry Harrison, William Henry Harrison and John Tyler, and Harrison is going to have the shortest presidency in American history, 30 days. Here's the map. 1834 to 1836 at the end of uh, Jackson's presidency. And if you've been following my other lessons, we went from a 13 small little colonies in the East Coast to 13 and 14 and 15 states and continual growth to the West with the Louisiana Purchase and then more territories becoming states. And the United States in the 1800s is going to continue to expand and move to the West. But this is going to bring a lot more controversy because it's going to be a debate on whether those new territories or states should be slave states or free states. And that, of course, will lead to the Civil War. But this is not about the events leading up to the Civil War. Of course, everything in the mid-1800s is connected and, and is leading towards that um, turning point in American history, 1861-1865 Civil War. Uh, but this is about Andrew Jackson and his presidency. And his, he was a very um, interesting man. Uh, he came from a very common upbringing. He wasn't an elite like John Quincy Adams. He was uh, uh, the common man. You know, that's who he, he, he said he supported was the common man. More white males could vote. Uh, African Americans couldn't vote. Native Americans couldn't vote. Women could not vote. But more people could vote under Andrew Jackson. And of course... In 1824 was a corrupt bargain where he lost to John Quincy Adams, but there seemed to be some corruption. And if you look at the history, it does seem like there was some shady business between John Quincy Adams and Henry Clay. And, of course, John Quincy Adams would win, but Andrew Jackson was not the person to sit back and let an election be stolen from him. So he spent four years preparing for the election of 1828, where he would go up against John Quincy Adams again, and he would beat him. And that election cycle was one of the worst, dirtiest election cycles in American history up to that point. And since then, there have been other ones, and it's kind of common now for them to be dirty and mudslinging. Uh, but it was 1828 where that all began. An uh, interesting thing about this picture is after his inaugural speech and after speaking to Congress, uh, after becoming the president, it was common for them to have like a party uh, outside the White House. And people would go right into the House. So there's just normal, common people going into the White House. And this was one of the bigger parties when Andrew Jackson became president. And when people were inside, they were jumping on furniture and muddying up the furniture and the, the sofas and whatnot, and it got out of control. So this was one of the more out-of-control parties after an inauguration. And they would continue this tradition until the late 1800s. It was under Grover Cleveland that he said it's a security issue, obviously. Um, could you imagine them doing it today? <laughs> 
Uh, but it was a security issue, so he had a parade, and that's where the parade comes from. Now, one of the big issues underneath Jackson is the tariff of abominations, or what would happen with the tariff of, of abominations. So, to be clear, John Quincy Adams, who was a Democratic Republican, but he would become a Whig, or a National Republican, which is, the, for simplicity's sake, is the same thing. They were more for the, the bigger government, the national bank, and tariffs, internal improvements, and stuff like that. So underneath Jackson, sorry, John Quincy Adams' administration, he passed some tariffs. Henry Clay would have agreed with these, and some of these bigger government people during that time make the country stronger. It was the idea. But Jackson, who was a Democratic Republican who was going to become a Democrat, gets a little confusing, but is the, the party splits when Jackson becomes president because the ones that hate him will go to the Whigs. The people that love him will go with the Democrats, the first Democrat in American history. But the Democrats were usually for small government, were against the tariffs. So the tariff of 1828 was um, signed when Quincy was president, but it was going to be enacted when Andrew Jackson was president. Now, the South hated it. They called it the Tariff of Abominations. And so did the Vice President, John C. Calhoun from South Carolina. Uh, he hated it too. And he was actually the Vice President underneath Andrew Jackson, and he would be replaced with Martin Van Buren during his second term. But he was very outspoken about it, and this caused a lot of conflict between the President, Andrew Jackson, and the Vice President, John C. Calhoun, until he left office. Now, I should mention that you would expect as a Democrat, or earlier as a Democratic Republican, Jackson would want to abolish or not enact the abominations. He would kill it, but he didn't for some reason, possibly for pragmatic reasons or who knows why, but he, he didn't, he didn't, uh, he didn't kill it. Um, and a lot of people were very disappointed in that. So Calhoun and other people in the South, and especially in South Carolina, they supported what was called the nullification uh, of the tariffs of 1828 and a new one that happened in 1832. So their idea was, well, you know what, it's unconstitutional. That was our argument. And we will nullify it. So if we think it's unconstitutional, our state has the right to nullify it. Of course, that's not exactly how the Constitution works. But the South argued that... Uh, uh, in South Carolina, more specifically, argued that states could nullify federal laws if they were unconstitutional. So this is that idea of states' rights, which will become very important leading up until the American Civil War. Uh, and South Carolina threatened to succeed from the Union. So does that sound familiar? If you know about American history and the Civil War, it's going to be South Carolina who first succeeds from the Union, which is going to spark the American Civil War in 1861. Um but this has happened in, 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 the, in the 1830s. So this is 30 years before the, the, the American uh, Civil War. Now, Jackson is furious. And Jackson is not the type of person that likes to lose. So he has that type of personality. So he passes what's called, what it, well, he actually he encouraged Congress to pass the force bill, where he actually sent military in to enforce the tariffs. And a compromise was made. With the help of Henry Clay, the tariffs were lowered, and South Carolina stopped the nullification process. But they nullified the force bill, ironically. Um, but here is, here is, here's a few things. With the nullification crisis, you have these tariffs, and it really helps the North, right? Because they're going to put tariffs on imports from, from Europe and from Britain, and people aren't going to buy them because it's too expensive. They're going to buy manufactured goods from the North. And so that's great for the North. But the South, well, Europe and Britain, they're going to do a reciprocal tariff to put tariffs on like raw materials from the United States, which is going to hurt the South. They can't sell their stuff to, the, to, uh, to Europe. So that, that's why they're angry. And they really considered this to be um, uh, a slave tax. They thought it was an anti-slavery tax. So uh, that's why they're angry. Uh, but the important thing here is, is we're seeing what is almost happening with, um, 
with the Civil War. I mean, the, the country is already divided. It's already sectionalized between the North, South, and West. And there are events like the 1820 Missouri Compromise, which are getting the, the country closer and closer to the Civil War. You know, Thomas Jefferson talked about that before he died. And here in the 1830s, there was almost a Civil War, right? I mean, there, there was, in some aspects, you could say Andrew Jackson stopped the Civil War from happening in the 1830s. But this is a nullification crisis, so this is very important uh, during the age of Jackson. There's also the Eaton Affair. Now, the Eaton Affair is, um, it should be noted that at this time, women were seen as the protectors of the nation's value, values. Uh, they were supposed to raise children and, and raise well-behaved children and be models of, of um, decency and um, any idea or any, any, any hint of infidelity was not accepted back at, in the 1830s. And this was especially true for the, the people in Washington, the wives of the husbands, uh, the wives of the, the politicians or the presidents or the vice presidents or the cabinet members. Uh, they were expe expected to, to conduct themselves in a certain way. Well, what happened was there was a cabinet member for Andrew Jackson, and his uh, wife was, well, his name was John Henry Eaton. He was the Secretary of War. His wife uh, became Margaret O'Neill. But see, this is a problem, is Margaret O'Neill was married before to a Navy man. And this Navy man was out on sea and he committed suicide. He killed himself. Uh, and it was suspected or accused that they were having a relationship before this happened. So she kind of got the, the, the label of being a cheater. Um, now, I'm not sure if that's true or not, but they married short, six months, nine months, very shortly after uh, her ex-husband or her, her husband who, who died, um, uh, she married quite quickly after. Uh, it also should be mentioned that uh, her family owned a boarding house in Washington, in D.C., and she was known for, for getting around there, if you know what I mean. So, uh, so she kind of had a bad reputation. And she was ostracized. She was ostracized by all of the cabinet members, but mostly Floride Calhoun, the vice president of John C. Calhoun. In fact, she was not even welcome anywhere near these women. And John C. Calhoun, I guess, was encouraged it or he didn't stop it, right? But this is the thing is Andrew Jackson supported uh, John Henry Eaton. Uh, he didn't like the way his wife was being treated. And uh, he didn't support... Uh, you know, her being treated this way. And also, you should know that before he became president, he was married to a woman named Rachel. Well, Rachel, she was married before too. But she was married to an abusive husband and she had to get away. And she got away and she didn't technically get a divorce. I believe she expected her husband to sign the papers or make it official, but he never did. So when she married Jackson years later, well... She was technically still married. So during the election of 1828, if you remember, I said it was one of those mudslinging elections with John Quincy Adams. People were terrible to Rachel Adams, just humiliated her in, in, in the public, right, in the newspapers. And she died right before Andrew Jackson became president. Now, it's not necessarily related to this ridicule and this mudslinging that she received, but Jackson blamed it on them. He blamed it on the, the, the Adams campaign, and he would never forget it. So when he became president, and then one of his new cabinet members has a wife who may or may not have been done some, you know, uh, some cheating or something that wasn't accepted back in the 1830s, uh, he wouldn't accept the other cabinet members uh, treating her or John Henry Eaton like that. So four of the, the cabinet members ended up resigning. So this kind of just plays into this kind of chaotic um, atmosphere underneath the Jackson um, presidency. Now, what he's very famous for is the bank war. So to review, there's, there's been two national banks at this time. So in 1791 to 1811, we have the first bank of the United States. 
And then 1816 to 1836, we have the second Bank of the United States. So the first one in 1791 was, was Alexander Hamilton, and he was a Federalist. Now, the Federalists are gone, right? And the Whigs were, they're not the replacement of the Federalists, but they have some similar um, ideas or ideologies. But it was Hamilton's uh, first National Bank of the United States, which George Washington agreed with, but the Democratic Republicans, the Jeffersonians, they didn't agree with it, right? They're more agrarian. They thought the bank gave the United States um, government too much power. They thought it was unconstitutional. So in 1811, James Madison, who was also uh, a Democratic Republican, he was a Federalist during the, the debates over the Constitution, but he was a Democratic Republican by the time he became president, you know, smaller government. He, he did not renew... The, re- the charter. He did not do a recharter. He let it expire because it was very, you know, a lot, a lot of people didn't like it and a lot of people um, didn't like the second one either. But then came the War of 1812 and the debt and the money printing and the problems that were arising from the War of 1812. After it, in 1860, the same president, James Madison, restarted the the bank, but this is the second bank of the United States. So that's going to go from 1816 to 1836. And this is not going to be popular either. I mean, this is a continuity in American history. People hated the first bank of the United States. People hated the second bank of the United States. People hate the Federal Reserve today, which is, in essence, the bank of the United States. So this is something that continually happens in American history. Well, there's the Panic of 1819, which they're going to blame on the bank for being careless and lending too much. And uh, it's not going to be popular either. And more Democratic Republicans slash Democrat, it's about the same time when the parties split. Uh, more Democratic Republicans are, are, they don't hate it as much as they used to, but many do. And one of those who did hate it was Andrew Jackson. He was hurt in the Panic of 1819, and he, he thought... Um, it gave the he thought you know he gave the federal government too much power. He thought it was unconstitutional. He thought there was too much corruption. He blamed it for the Panic of eighteen nineteen because they lended too much and they hoarded too much gold, which took gold away from other banks. So, to simplify that, basically, he, a lot of a lot of the same arguments for the first national bank are going to be talked about in the second national bank. But now you have uh, a prior general. The, the hero of the Battle of New Orleans is a strong, um, powerful man who doesn't like to lose. He's going to have a war with the National Bank. So in 1832, uh, uh, the, the, it was Nicholas Beidle in, in Congress. They're going to they're gonna try to do a recharter for 1836. That's four years before. It was in 1832. Four years before it's, it, it was set to expire. But Jackson vetoed it. He vetoed the recharter. So it was going to end in 1836. But there's four more years before the charter is over, and Jackson is not done. He took all the federal money from the national banks and to selected state banks around the United States. And his critics would call these pet banks. But this would be a little chaotic, moving the money and, and, and not having the regulation from the national bank. So this is going to cause some problems, which we will find out about, find out about soon. But nonetheless, this powerful, strong man who does whatever he wants, right? He sends the army. Well, first of all, he's a general, right? He, he killed many British people and the British soldiers in the Battle of New Orleans. He fought the Native Americans and killed lots of Native Americans. He used to fight in duels. Now he's president, and he, number one... Um, does sends the army to South Carolina to stop them from misbehaving or not listening to federal commands, uh, and then he he does a war with the with the with the, with the with the banks, and he, he's successful. So his critics were calling him King Andrew the First. So uh, he was accused of redistributing wealth to lazy people, of putting the rich against the poor, and being a tyrant. And it should be noted that it was very common for presidents to be called a tyrant or a king or a monarchist because it was only, what, 50 years since the American Revolution, which is a decent amount of time, but um, that was a bad thing. That's why they fought the, that's why the founding fathers fought the war, so they wouldn't um, 
have a king, right? An all-powerful federal government or federal king. But that's what they're accusing uh, King Andrew the first of. Now, if you look at this picture, uh, we can analyze it in different ways. So there's different things you can look for, right? First of all, uh, as a historian or a, his a student of history or just a history buff, it's important to use these documents to understand history. I mean, this shows you how people felt, this picture, this illustration, right? It's better than just reading it in a secondary source like your textbook. Uh, but it shows you how people felt. And they, 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 in sometimes artists, I mean, you can use primary sources written, obviously, but this one is, is, is a drawing. And the author is unknown, but uh, you can look at it different things, like, for example, the historical context. And you can see he has a veto thing in his hand. So this is in the context of him being the president and vetoing the bank or him being the president and being all powerful and doing whatever he wants. You can also think of the intended audience. So who is this drawing for? And, you know, you can't say 100% who it's for, but we can speculate that it's probably for, well, the American people. They're probably, it might be to the people that are, you know, singing to the choir, to the people that already don't like him to show that he's a king and we got to get rid of him, right? That he's stomping on the Constitution, he's stomping on the internal improvements. Uh, and possibly poor, rich, both. It probably even his supporters probably trying to tell his supporters, look at why do you support this guy? This guy is all powerful. Um, so you can you can consider things like that, and you can also consider things like, for example, uh, exaggeration. Right? Does the author exaggerate anything? Sometimes you know they exaggerate the, the facial expressions or or actions in some of the cartoons or illustrations. And here I would say the exaggeration is obviously in the, the depiction of him as a king. Because he wasn't a king. He was a president in the United States that has a constitution that doesn't allow for a king to be all-powerful. Even though some presidents have had or exerted more power than other presidents throughout history. And some could argue it's much like a king. But I think the, the, the whole ambiance and the whole outfit is an exaggeration to try to express his point. Uh, other things you can lack, look at is... For example, um, an analogy. What is this an analogy of? Right. This is an analogy of he's he's. It's when you compare two things that are not the like, but they have some similarities to express your point. And this analogy will, of course, be to maybe a British or a French king, uh, which is very anti-American at that time, especially at that time. Um. Yeah. That's it. Okay. I'm not going to say it's because of his his actions, but the economy boomed in 1834 to 1336. In fact, right before this boom, there was a little, you know, it's a free market economy. In free market economies, the economy goes up and down, up and down. And some, some ups are big and some downs are big, right? Uh, before this, there was a little downside, right? A little, a little not even a recession, but you know, a little correction. And that was because Bidel was, was changing was was messing with the National Bank, right, it, for the purpose of fighting uh, Andrew Jackson. But he stopped that because it was unpopular. And in 1834 to 1836, the economy boomed. People were buying cotton. Uh, land prices were more and more expensive. People had jobs. So there was an economic boom. Now, was that related? Can we? Is there a correlation between that and, and Andrew Jackson's policies? Well, let's go to the next slide and you tell me. Well, in 1837, it's going to be the greatest depression in American history. Some economists and historians say it was worse than the 1929 depression. And if you're a historian or economist, I would love to, for you to comment below and tell me if I am correct. But uh, it was big, and most people don't even know what it is. But basically, after a little boom, and after all the chaos with the bank wars and other issues that were happened during Jackson's uh, presidency, there is a panic, a two-day panic, which is going to lead to a six or seven-year uh, depression. And a depression is when people are not working, businesses are closed, money is not moving, and it lasts a long time. <laughs> um, but there are different reasons, and many. there's many reasons that this one happened, uh, and these are some of them. Uh, number one, there were sales of Western land 
which promoted speculation, unhealthy speculation, and poorly regulated lending practices. So just imagine after Jackson closes the banks, which also part of the National Bank would was to print money and, and to, to regulate banks and to uh, lend money and make sure the lending process was, wasn't uh, irresponsible. Well, now with all these pet banks and these other banks called wildcat banks, which are in the West, which are just banks, unregulated, doing whatever they want to make some money. These banks were, were lending money too much. And, and back then, money was backed by gold and silver. So a lot of, a lot of banks didn't have the gold and silver to, to back it up. So they were just given paper, kind of like today in a way. <laughs> uh, There's also the species circular. So this is important. So if you're a student or a teacher, write this in your notes. Uh, this this was passed by Jackson, right? Now, if you go back to the first point, remember the National Bank is closed, so we can kind of blame Jackson on this, right? Not 100%, but we can certainly a little bit. Uh, the species circulaire was also underneath Jackson. Uh, mind you, the Panic of 1837 happens under Martin Van Buren. He's the guy next to, behind Jackson on the donkey. Uh, it happens five weeks into his presidency. The species circulaire was, uh, it, you know, he was worried about people speculating too much, especially with this unregulated, this money, this paper money. So he said, if you're going to buy land, federal land in the West, you have to use gold and silver. So what does that mean? Well, most people are going to go to the banks and they're going to exchange their banknotes for gold and silver. And if everybody's taken out of the bank, how much gold and silver is in the bank? Not much, not enough. So it's going to be hard for them to lend and when people want to redeem their notes, they can't do it. Uh, also, state banks were printing too much money. Again, no bank in the United States to regulate this. Europe bought less American cotton because they had economic difficulties. So they, they this hurt the South. Uh, also, there was, by chance, which happens periodically, is a bad wheat harvest in the United States. And there was no available credit. If people can't borrow money, they can't buy things. So all this led to, to a panic, and it's called the Panic of 1837. Uh, there's other ones in American history, like the Panic of 1819, and some more in the 1800s, and of course 1929. But Panic of, 30, of 1837 was potentially worse than the 1929 one. So the bursts, it bursts, sorry, not the bursts, it burst in 1837. Federal land sales plummeted. Land that used to cost $10 an acre was now worth $3 an acre, and people couldn't sell it. Um, credit had dried up. People couldn't borrow money. And on May 4th in 37, when Martin Van Buren was president, there was a run on the banks. Everybody went to go redeem their gold or silver, but they didn't have the gold and silver. For example, in New York, the bank stopped accepting banknotes for gold or silver. Uh so this, this was a panic. It's a, a two-day panic that happened five weeks into the presidency of Martin Van Buren, but that led to a six- or seven-year depression. And, and if you look at this picture, you know, you see people are drunk. You see homeless people with their baby, uh, people begging, people out of work. Uh, you also see people rushing for the bank or rushing to get their, 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 uh, their gold and silver. You also see a balloon falling from the sky, and I'm not sure what it says on there, but it must be something significant. And of course, you have Old Glory with the hat and the glasses, which represents Andrew Jackson, who's no longer president right now. So here are the results. The banks collapsed. Uh, half of them failed. Almost half, a little less. Businesses failed. Prices declined. There were bread riots, people rioting just to get bread. And unemployment went to as high as 25%. And that is similar to the Great Depression. So many blame Jackson uh, on his policies. And I think historically, a lot of people will put the blame on the bank wars and uh, you know closing the National Bank. And also the species circulaire where people had to use gold to buy land. So people blame that. And of course, Jackson and his supporters, they blamed the National, the Second Bank of the United States, the National Bank. But President Van Buren would also be blamed. He'd be a one-term president. Remember, this happened right when he became president. And he didn't do much because some people wanted him to open up the Third Bank of the United States, but he didn't. He didn't believe it. He was a Democrat. Uh, and when I say Democrat, 
Don't think of the Democrats of today. It was a different time. Things have changed a lot. Um, he's a one-term president, so he's going to get blamed for this. And, you know, that's another thing is presidents often get blamed for what happens during the presidency, how they react, whether they do a great job reacting or whether they do a terrible job. And sometimes the reaction is kind of out of their control, but they'll still get blamed for it. And Martin Van Buren is, is one of them. Um, but one thing that would come out of this is uh, a credit ranking system. So today, if you're going to go buy a house, you have to have good credit. Well, where does that come from? It comes from the 1830s with different companies, but it's lasted and changed and evolved into what it is today. But if you have a lot of credit that you never pay back, it's going to be hard for you to borrow money. And that started in the 1830s. All right, I'm going to move on. There's going to be some more political parties. So just to review... And watch my other videos for the the description of the, d the different political parties throughout American history. But I'm going over the, the, the biggest ones. The beginning, George Washington, no party. Okay, and then after, or while he's president, naturally they form two parties, the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans. So Jefferson was a Democratic Republican. George Washington was no party, but he supported Federalist ideas. Now the Federalists won't last very long. They'll last... They'll have another president, John Adams, and that will be it. And then during the era of good feelings, there's only one party. It's a one-party system, and it's the Democratic-Republicans. And then you have Andrew Jackson, and Andrew Jackson, who is hated, is going to split the haters and the, the lovers, right? So the haters, they're going to be called National Republicans, and then the Democratic Republicans. But the Democratic, the National Republicans who hate Jackson, they're going to become the Whigs. And the Democratic Republicans, they're going to become the Democrats. So we have the first political party that we still have today. No Republicans, no, you know, part, the Republicans of today. But the Dem Democrats of today we have under Jackson. So we have the Whigs and the Democrats, but then there's going to be smaller parties. And throughout American history, there's going to be a lot of smaller parties, but some of them never have a chance to win. One of those smaller parties was called the anti-Masonic party. So, it was, and this, it was formed in, in the 1820s or 1830s, around then, about the time of Jackson. Maybe, maybe a little earlier, I'm sorry. Google it. Okay. Um, so, it, for, it was formed to destroy the Freemasons. And the Freemasons, they started in the 1300s, or maybe earlier. Some people disagree when they started. Uh, but they were stonemasons. So, they made these beautiful churches, like Notre Dame in France, and uh, cathedrals and buildings. And the stonemasons who were talented would meet and they would be secretive and share their secrets, how they did it, and they would build some more. Well, in the 1700s, with, with market economies evolving and or, or being born in some different places around the world, in Europe and the U.S., uh, it changed into a secret society where they claim to have adherence to the ideals of the Enlightenment. But more specifically, these were some of the elites, the intelligence, where they met and they shared secrets. And uh, it was a secret society and a little suspicious, right? Uh, sometime in the 1820s, there was some murder in New York where somebody was going to uh, write a book about all the secrets of the Freemasons, and he was he disappeared, right? So these stories really became legend and, and uh, the Freemasons kind of have this Illuminati type of feel. Some people have said they are related to Illuminati, but I don't think that's true. But they are a secret society. George Washington was a part of it. Andrew Jackson was a part of it. Henry Clay. Uh, lots of prominent early Americans were a part of it. So again, it was kind of this secret elite societies where they're very smart and they, they would share their ideas. But because of their secrecy and their strange behavior and this guy disappearing, uh, one of the parties would be called the Anti-Masonic Party. And they really thought there was some big conspiracy where the Freemasons were controlling the Republic. How much of that is true or not true, I don't know. Uh, but they would obviously not make it, and a lot of them would join the Whig Party. So if you remember, I have the National Republicans and the Democratic Republicans. The National Republicans become the Whigs, and the anti-Masonic people also become the Whigs. And so do, and not all, of course, some of them might become Democrats, but the Know Nothing Party. This is the American Party, the anti-immigration party, because in the 1800s, a lot of people were coming from Europe, Germans, Irish, Jews. 
and Americans feared the immigrants. They feared they would take their jobs. You know, I mean, people in a city uh, might work in a very uh, low-paying job, fears that an immigrant might take their job. So it's for pragmatic reasons. But there was also a fear of Catholics because the United States was more of a Protestant nation from the beginning, and it didn't really treat Catholics properly. They weren't always welcome <laughs> in certain areas of the United States. Well, now they're, they're worried about this conflict between the Protestants and the Catholics like they saw in Europe. Uh, so that's another one of their fears. Uh, but a lot of them, the Know Nothing parties are also going to join the Whigs. So we also have the Whigs. So we have the rise of the Whigs. And it's going to be started by this beautiful man. His name is Henry Clay, whose name pops up all over American history. Um, he's going to be a part of the National Republicans, which is the <clears throat> anti-Jackson party. Uh, and then after 32, he's going to go, uh, he's going to go up against at Jackson for, you know, f- after, you know, his mid election. Right. And Jackson is going to win. Henry Clay is never going to win the presidency. So Clay starts the Whig party. Uh, in a united different parties like the National Republicans, the Anti-Masonic Party, the Know Nothing Party, <clears throat> and the disaffected Democrats. So people that didn't want to be, maybe they didn't like Jackson's nullification crisis because they're Democrats. They didn't like the tariffs, so they might have joined the Whig Party. Um, <clears throat> and unfortunately, the Whigs would lose in 1836 to Martin Van Buren. Let me write that down. I made a mistake there. Uh, Martin Van Buren. Um, and, and yeah, he would defeat the Whigs. He, he defeated five candidates, actually. But Martin Van Buren, who, who, who's going to become president because the economy is so good underneath Andrew Jackson? And then, of course, he's going to die in 1837 with the Panic of 1837. So Martin Van Buren is going to lose after four years. And um, But, okay, I gotta, I'll go to the Whig candidates. But <clears throat> here's, a, here's a simplified uh, version of what they believed in. Uh, the Whigs, they believed in a national bank and internal improvements, which means infrastructure, <clears throat> and also protective uh, tariffs. So it's like Henry Clay's American system, you know, strong central government. A lot of them were located in the middle to the New England area, the Northeast, and a lot of them were urban workers. Uh, now, the Democrats, they were limited government. They believed in states' rights, and they believed in free trade. And they were located uh, mostly in the South and West. And there were also some urban professionals as well. So these are some of the differences between the two parties. But this brings us to our first Whig president. And unfortunately, they choose a guy named William Henry Harrison. So William Henry Harrison, he was the hero <clears throat> in the Battle of Tippecanoe when they fought Tecumseh. Because Tecumseh united a lot of different Native American tribes to try to stop Western expansion. And it was the closest the Native Americans got to, you know, forming maybe their own country or to stopping the United States from, from continuing into the Louisiana Purchase. Um, but he was the hero of the Battle of Tippecanoe, and he defeated um, Tecumseh's Confederacy. So he chose John Tyler as the vice president. And John Tyler was a Southerner and he believed he was a slaveholder and he was chosen because he was going to balance the ticket out, right, and help uh, William Henry Harrison become elected. Uh, but his slogan was Tippecanoe and Tyler too. And he would win, but he died 30 days into his presidency. So that was an unfortunate uh, part of of uh, the first wig, only 30 days. In fact, he had the longest inaugural speech, two hours, in the cold without a hat and without an overcoat, and then he died 30 days later. Some people connect it to his inaugural speech, but um, other people do not. So the longest inaugural speech in, in American history and the shortest presidency. Um, there was also uh, uh, an issue of race and uh you know, during Jacksonian uh, democracy. Um, Jackson, he did own slaves. And the abolition, abolitionist movement is, is, is becoming more and more spread and more and more um, passionate abolitionists are, are popping up. Uh, more common white people can vote during Jackson's uh, presidency and after. 
Um, it's not just the rich and elites as before, but there are there are also new laws where, where black people in the north could not vote because before they could, and now they all of a sudden can't. So they're making laws where people in the north who used to have the right to vote could not vote. And there were 400,000 free blacks in the north. So uh, we're getting closer and closer to the, the civil war. Um, there was also the Denmark Vesey Rebellion and the Nat Turner's Rebellion. Denmark Vesey happened in the 1820s and Nat Turner in 1831. Uh, but these were two examples of, um, of, of African slaves fighting back uh, for their rights and uh, trying to be free. Um, and this also increased the fear in the South of, of a slave rebellion like what happened in Haiti. Uh, they were, were, were terrified of that, and it's going to become a reality, or almost a reality, with John Brown right before the um, American uh, Civil War. Um, but these are going to lead, especially Nat Turner's rebellion, is going to lead to more uh, Southerners uh, making laws and restricting uh, black slaves from assembling or being educated. So it's going to be, become even stricter for some, some slaves in the South. Also, during the 1830s, there's this guy named Thomas Dartmouth Rice, who was an entertainer uh, from the 1830s. And his signature act was playing a character known as Jim Crow. And Jim Crow was an enslaved man, uh, the, 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 the character in this little play he did. And Rice, the, the actor, he painted his face black. So this is kind of the origin of blackface, which is very insulting, uh, which would be insulting and would, would continue after the American Civil War uh, to black people. Later, after the Civil War, between 1870 and the 1960s, laws that segregated blacks and whites would be known as the Jim Crow laws. So this is where it originated from. And today, there are some celebrities and there are some leaders and politicians who go out uh, acting as a, as a character and they will, maybe when they're younger, and they'll paint their face black, thinking that they're, they're being that character, that famous person, right? Uh, but it resembles blackface and that's why it, it can be very insulting if you understand the history of it. Um, so that's it. Andrew Jackson's period was was very tumultuous uh, and uh, changing with his with his more open democracy, but also his treatment of slaves and his treatment of, Na of Native Americans uh, is going to make him very controversial. Uh, also, the, the 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 bank wars and the nullification crisis is also going to make his presidency uh, famous. So uh, so that is it. We are getting closer to the Civil War. Thanks for watching this much. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. If you are a teacher, please do check out my store below. And if you're a teacher or a student, please give me a thumbs up and also subscribe. Uh, or leave a comment. I would love to hear what you have to say. That could really help me uh, with, with my channel. Thank you so much.